Gentle Marketers. Welcome to Season 8 and Episode 59 of the Gentle Business Revolution Podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm and changing it to a gentler approach, one that's based on empathy and kindness. As always, I'm Sarah Zanacroce. I'm the host. I'm still here. We're in Season 8 and heading uh, towards the end of this crazy, crazy year. Right now, um, Switzerland is definitely heading towards a lockdown again. Um, As I am recording this on Monday, and you're going to hear this on Friday, already one of the cantons uh, in Switzerland, which is kind of like states in in the US, uh, is already locked down. And gosh, who knows um, if we're going to lock down the whole country again. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting winter. And then of course, in the US, it's election week. So it doesn't get any crazier than that. But um, yeah, just like Everyone, I'm also, uh, you know, having ups and downs, good days, and then not so good days. But really, what helps me is is connecting with nature. And at least out there, I feel like everything is actually okay. And then, of course, going inwards or doing my yoga. And there, I also just forget about the craziness out there. So I'm going back and forth between you know, despair and thinking this world is going to poop and and then thinking, well, but we got to do something about it and, you know, get all active and, and yeah, really change um, what's, uh, you know, what we can change. So this episode is kind of um, one of the ones where I I feel, I feel hopeful that that's the direction we're going. So let me back up and, and kind of tell you that this episode falls under the P of passion on the gentle marketing mandala. And if you're new here and you don't know what I'm talking about, you can download your one page marketing plan with the gentle marketing version of the seven P's of marketing at sarasinacroce.com forward slash one page, the number one page. It comes with seven email prompts to really help you reflect on these different P's. So I chose the word passion for the gentle marketing mandala, but I could have equally chosen purpose. To me, they kind of go together. If you have purpose, then you have passion. And it's almost like if you have passion, then probably you have purpose. So they really go together. So I'm talking about the triple win in the gentle marketing program and in my upcoming book, The Gentle Marketing Revolution. So the triple win is a win for our planet, a win for our client, and a win for ourselves. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about in this episode. And I'm joined by my friend Sarah Young, who also thinks about this triple bottom line a lot and integrates it into her business. So before I tell you a bit more about Sarah, again, that's really where I think we're heading and or that's when I am hopeful and I think, yes, you know, all of this is happening for a reason. This deconstruction is happening for a reason and we just need to get through this and humanity has been through more difficult times than now. Um, It keeps me going when I think about conversations like this one that there is change coming and that a lot of companies already are thinking about that, that it's not just about our individual needs, but it's about the collective needs. It's about, you know, the, the, the planet's needs. So just wanted to kind of, again, uh, come full circle and explain why uh, I'm talking about this triple bond line with Sarah. So here's some more information on Sarah. 
Sarah is grateful to work with incredible individuals, teams, and organizations to increase their positive impact in the world in a way that feels inspired and alive through leadership and human development, deep partnership, and highly curated experiences. Sarah brings nearly a decade of ex- executive leadership experience in the corporate world, along with in- extensive training, certifications, education, and experience in the above areas. She believes that we first must look within our ourselves before we attempt to coach or lead others and brings a deep commitment to serving and empowering her clients in a way that is equal parts fierce, honest, and loving. When she's not with her incredible clients, Sarah can usually be found with her adorable and hilarious rescue dog somewhere in nature, biking around town during the summer, experimenting in the kitchen, reading, or writing. So, In this episode, we discuss, as I mentioned, this triple bottom line or the triple win that, like I call it, and and what it is, the conscious alignment with Mother Nature that's kind of tied to your purpose. Sarah shares some examples of how she applies the triple bottom line in her business. We also talk about this idea of the worldview and how that impacts our marketing And then Sarah shares some of her predictions of the future of business and leadership. So where we're heading. So I can't wait to share this conversation with you. So let's dive right in. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I am great. How about you, Sarah? I'm good. It's fun to say hi, Sarah. (laughs) And with an H at the end, too. Exactly. (laughs) So um, happy to talk to you. We've been on a, what would you call it, a mastermind, maybe? Yes, kind of a small mastermind together and uh, got to really know each other and just realize we are, yeah, our values are so aligned, our worldviews are aligned. And so when I thought about people to talk to you about this topic that we're talking about today, the triple bottom line. I was like, yeah, I want to talk to Sarah. Mm, Thank you. I'm so honored to get to talk to you about it. Yeah. So why don't we start with a definition about this triple bottom line? So what is that? Yeah, it's a great, a great first question. So triple bottom line is typically today it's referred to as people, profit and planet the way that it first came about was in 1994 by a gentleman named John Elkington, who is said to have been the first person to kind of talk about this. And at that time, the the definition, so to speak, was social, environmental, and financial. But really, it's this idea of how can we, the way I think about it is how can we make decisions in a way that is in the highest good for those three things? So for people for the planet, and then ultimately in a way that, you know, moves our business forward in a positive way. Mm, Yeah, I really think that is so key, of course, to what we do here in in gentle marketing. But just, it's probably, when did you say 1990? Yeah, apparently the the first use of it was in 1994. 1994, um, okay. Yeah, I think that must have been like, yeah, so different because back then I'm sure most businesses were still operating with only one idea and that was profit, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden to include people and planet, yeah, must have been like revolutionary. What do you think? Totally. Yeah. And it's interesting. I was doing some reading about the history of it and Apparently, John Elkington, the gentleman who is credited with first talking about this, apparently he's he's written a couple of things to say we need to, you know, rethink this and revive this in a little bit of a different way, you know, for the modern time. But I think you're right that at that time, at that time, it was probably very revolutionary and a very different way of thinking about business. Mm -hmm. In gentle marketing lingo, I refer to it to the triple win. So yes. Win for you know also the ourselves, win for the clients, and win for the world. So so same idea except that it's a triple win because again I think those three pillars really are 
so important and especially for gentle marketers it's important that the that win for ourselves is in there because sometimes we are really good at you know serving and 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 yeah serving our clients or or trying to make a difference in the world but we forget ourselves and sometimes we even forget oh yeah it should be profitable so, totally. so the win for ourselves is is key in there as well I love that. It's so funny that you say that. Well, for two reasons. Number one is I love that idea of the triple win. And I, I use that a lot as well. So I don't think you and I have ever talked about that, but I love that. I love that you do that as well. And I completely relate to what you said as I was reflecting prior to our conversation. I was thinking about, okay, which of these P's, you know, come most naturally for me and which which come less naturally. And I was thinking the same thing that, you know, I tend to think a lot about people and planet, but sometimes <laughs> Sometimes I don't necessarily make the decisions that are best for profit or for the business. So I totally relate to what you're saying. And I love that you focus on that for your clients in terms of remembering ourselves or our own business as part of that equation. Yeah. And it's, it has to do with kind of offline. We talked about, you know, the, the, the safety net. And if we don't take care of that, of the profit and making sure that we have enough and, you know, everybody's definition of enough is different, but if we make enough, then we can serve others. But if we are always worried about our own safety and security, then, then it's very difficult to help others as well. It's so true. And it's such a good point. I want to read a paragraph that I found on your about page. So Sync Collaborative, that's the name of your company, partners with conscious companies who care not only about results, but about people and about the planet. The Sync Collaborative community is made of, up of leading companies across a variety of industries that model what conscious business looks like. This means that in addition to focusing on the bottom line and the results, members of the Zinc Collaborative community prioritize people and leadership development, sustainability, and environmental stewardship, volunteering and service, creating a diverse and welcoming working environment, and giving back to their community. It's so beautiful. And I, th I think because you really position that like, almost, you would say, uh, top fold, right? Very high in, on your about page. And it feels like a very important statement, kind of like a mission statement to you. And, uh, you know, this idea of here's what I stand for. And that's also the reason why I placed this episode under the first P of the gentle marketing mandala. And that P stands for passion or purpose. So would you say that the triple bottom line has a strong connection to your purpose? Yes, absolutely. And it's funny. So many, many years ago, before I ever started my business, I had this vision of starting a business and I had no idea what the business was supposed to be. But in that vision, I had a business and then I had a nonprofit arm of the business as a way to give back. And mm -hmm. over time, and as I learned more and as things evolved, what I realized is that I don't necessarily need to start the nonprofit arm because there are so many nonprofits that are doing amazing work in the world that already exist. But you know, how can I use my business, a for-profit business, in a way that can be of service and give back? So even since before I had my business or even knew what my business was going to be, that idea has always been really important to me. And I believe, I personally believe that companies and conscious companies and conscious business, that we are the way of the future and that, that we can create significant positive change through the way that we do business. And, you know, as you and I were talking at the beginning, I live in the United States and what we're learning over and over again, especially recently, is we can't necessarily rely on you know, government or policies to create positive change. And I believe that as businesses and as leaders, we can model and create the kinds of change that we want to see. So that's always been really important to me. And I love the way that you mentioned you know, that verbiage as a, as a mission statement. And I think that's really true. And you know, it's what I get really excited about and it's how I like to work. And I get really excited about the idea of partnering with other companies that believe in the same and that like to work that way too. So for me, I feel like it's kind of at the core of 
you know, everything that I do and how I think about things. And like you and I were talking about this idea of the triple win, how can we work in a way that is in the highest good for everyone and everything involved? Yeah. So many things that you said resonated and, and it made me think that's so true. I guess before the triple bottom line, before this kind of became, you know, the new thing, it was either n profit or not non-for-profit, right? So it, it was these two types of businesses and it was an either or where now it's not an either or anymore. And, and, and that would, that's again, what feels so liberating. It's like, oh, I can be both. I can, you know, make a difference, make income for myself and my livelihood and, and also, you know, serve my clients that, that just feels so good. And to have this permission to, in a way, not have to fit in a, you know, either or a situation, profit or not for profit feels, feels really good. Absolutely. I, I think it's such a good point. And, you know, what I've observed in some cases is that not, not all of the time, of course, but in some cases, actually people are able to do more, you know, in this model because they're not having to focus on fundraising, you know, or receiving grants in addition to the mission. It's like, you can be really focused on the mission and, you know, create the financial abundance through the mission related work in a way that you can then give back and, you know, versus having to divide a focus for things like fundraising or, you know, grant writing, things like that. Yeah. Can you share maybe some specific examples um, on how you apply to triple bottom line in your business? So people plan a profit, if you could share with the listeners some specific examples. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing is, coming back to this idea we keep talking about, about, you know, using this as a decision point in the business. So whether we call it the triple win or the triple bottom line, you know, anytime I'm taking anything on, whether it's a new project or, you know, a client inquiry, thinking about if I say yes to this thing, is this in the highest good for everyone? And, and if not on the surface, you know, what shift could I make or could we make to make that possible? So I think the first thing is just a, an ongoing decision point of, you know, having that as a foundational piece of what I say yes and no to and what I decide to focus on in my business. A very tactical piece is I'm a member of 1% for the planet. So that means that 1% of all sales each year are donated to approved nonprofits that are working to, you know, protect our environment. And that has been something that's really joyful for me and has been really rewarding and fulfilling to be able to support the nonprofits and know that, you know, no matter what else I do in a given year, that percentage is being donated back. So that's, that's been, and, and that's just an incredible community to be a part of. There's a community of nonprofits and then there's a community of businesses who are 1% for the planet members. And that's been really fun as well to be able to connect with other businesses that, you know, are passionate about the same idea of triple bottom line and giving back and the planet. That sounds great. I need to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. I can send you, send you a link afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'll include it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That sounds great. And yeah, I think, you know, a few other things. One thing that I'm, I've been trying to be mindful of over the years is looking at other ways to make a positive impact in addition to, to giving financially. And so, you know, trying to share information and share resources to point people toward, that's something that I try to do regularly in my business. You know, in addition to the 1% donations, get giving back to causes that I care about. You know, I do different pricing tiers for different kinds of organizations. So whether it's a for-profit or a nonprofit or a public sector client, just honoring that structure in how I, you know, how I do pricing. And then I think fundamentally looking at, you know, am I working with the kinds of people who are aligned with these concepts as well? And, you know, if, if we engage in this work, how can we do it in a way that has the highest possible impact, not only for the participants, but 
also for that greater good or for the community. So, you know, in one of the leadership programs that I run, we do a project throughout the program and people can pick, you know, they can pick the project that they work on and some of them do a project for their company, but a lot of them end up doing a project for their community. So I've seen some really cool examples of people using the skills that we've talked about in the, in the leadership program. And then they've taken those out to a nonprofit in the community and, you know, made a really cool impact for the homeless population or for um, a cause that they care about, whether that's cancer survivors or, you know, another population of people. So that's been a kind of a fun one to see those ripples thinking about how can, how can that idea of the win, 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 or the triple bottom line not only exist within our work together, but then how can the ripples, you know, go beyond the program or the company or whatever that might be. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think sometimes it's, it's important to do those exercises with people and, and kind of give them some ideas of, you know, what they could be working on or, or what causes are out there. What I refer to in, in the upcoming Gentle Marketing Revolution book is the 17 um, Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. Where it's these categories, so 17 different um, categories such as world hunger, sea, you know, different different topics of problems that we need to solve as in, in, on our planet. And so sometimes I think having the conversation maybe around these different sustainable development goals helps people realize, oh yeah, I'm actually very passionate about, you know, this specific thing. And, and let me see what I can work on in my community. Obviously, you know, if you want to, you know, create a giant global project, great. But sometimes it's just about something very small within your community, right? That's such a good point. And I feel like it ties back to what you mentioned earlier, which was also a great point in terms of things not having to be either or, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, we don't have to necessarily choose. And I, I work with this a lot with my coaching clients where, you know, people feel called to do work that is more aligned with, you know, who they are and their purpose and the kind of impact that they want to have in the world. And sometimes that does mean, you know, a, a very big pivot. I have two clients right now that are shifting out of, they're shifting out of very, very different industries and into a sustainability related field. So sometimes it looks like that, but sometimes to your point, it might look like getting involved in a community organization while you're still working at your job. Or, you know, I have another colleague who started a sustainability, you know, committee and a sustainability focus within his existing organization. So I love what you're saying about introducing those ideas and then finding ways to move those things forward, even within our existing structures or companies or contexts. Yeah. And, and for entrepreneurs, I would also say just, just talking about these things, talking about what really matters to you. I often talk about, you know, bringing more of you to your marketing. Well, mm-hmm. if that's really what matters to you, then just talking about that in your newsletters, in your podcasts, that means that you're then resonating with ideal clients, right? Absolutely. Because I, I see you that doing a lot, like in your newsletter, for example, or, or the fact that you have these statements on your website. So how has doing that in your own business impacted the kind of clients you get? Like, do you feel like you're, you're having more joy working with these clients because already they're, you're kind of filtering people out. But if people are not at all interested in the triple bottom line, well, most likely they'll not even contact you because they see that statement so clearly on your site. That's a great point and, and a great question. And I get, I get sort of fired up about this general idea. And I think my my thoughts on it are a little bit different than some of the others out in the marketing world. And I know, I, I know this is true for you a lot of the time too, <laughs> but this idea of, you know, I feel like a lot of the traditional business advice or entrepreneurial advice is so focused on, you know, who is your niche and how can you talk to that niche? You know, like how can you, anything you're creating, how can you make sure that it's created for that specific person that you want to talk to, you know, out in your niche and not that, not that there's not a benefit in that, but 
what I sometimes ob- observe is that when entrepreneurs or business owners get so focused on that, they sometimes lose themselves in the process. And so, yes, I think at the end of the day, it's most important that what we're putting out into the world feels true for us. And, you know, the question that I ask myself over and over again is if I'm going to share something, if I'm going to write something, if I'm going to post anything on social media, is this in the highest integrity? Like, does this feel not just 80% true for me or 95% true, but does this feel 100% true for me? Like, can I stand behind this with every ounce of my being, you know, right now, right here in this moment? And not that, you know, perspectives can't evolve, but that's really, really important to me like you said, whether it's my newsletter or whether it's, you know, something else that I'm putting out online. And for that reason, I'm really mindful about, you know, things I share or things I repost or, you know, basically anything that I put out has to feel totally true. And I think what I've observed for myself and with others is if we are speaking from that place of truth and that place of integrity, and as you mentioned, that place of authenticity, like you said, we're going to attract the kinds of people who resonate with that. And I believe that at the end of the day, that's going to, that's going to lead to, you know, more fulfilling relationships all around. And I feel like it's something that it might take a little bit more time. You know, it's not flashy. It's not, Mm -hmm. it's not spamming people with a whole bunch of Facebook ads or, you know, like LinkedIn emails that all sound the same and pretend to be personalized, but it's like, <laughs> it's kind of a slow and steady build where we're putting ourselves out into the world um, in a way that feels true for us so that we can then, you know, connect with the people who we're meant to connect with in return. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know we're really aligned on some of this. <laughs> so, Yes. So it is true that you feel like you get more fulfillment, more joy, because the people who who are attracted to you and resonate with you, they're already on the same wavelength, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. (laughs) (laughs) Let's switch gears a bit and talk about some of the I mean, the other things that go together with the triple bottom line and, and, and kind of the things that we also see, which is green wa- greenwashing and rainbow washing and I don't know what else washing. It kind of has become the latest fashion to also display green and, and diversity messages, especially the bigger companies. You see them doing that. My question is to you, do you know if there's any kind of accountability like who holds these companies accountable when they say you know these things but there's no really a control there's no check whether this is actually true or or not yeah it's such a good question and i think it's a really interesting question because if we go back in time you know many many years in the past before you know before this became popular I was thinking about the idea of natural foods. So the fact that a lot of of companies can put on their box or their bag all natural. And I think for a lot of years, people assumed that if something said all natural, that that meant it was all natural or (laughs) it was organic or it was healthy or whatever it might be. And in the last few years, we've, we've learned that, you know, all natural is not a claim that's really regulated at all. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. And, you know, it may or may not be quote unquote natural. And I feel like in some ways we could equate that same idea to, you know, this idea of of greenwashing, so to speak, of making a claim that we believe in the planet or we believe in the environment or we believe in equity or whatever it is, whether or not we're doing anything, you know, in that way. I think it's a tricky question because I've been I've been reading and studying about this a lot, uh, especially in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm-hmm. And you know, the question of how do you how do you create positive change in these spaces in a way that is meaningful and that's not just you know taking the easy step of 
you know, switching out some photos or, you know, putting the line on your website, whatever it might be. And when I've been researching and reading, what some people have said is those things might be the first step. <clears throat> so a company that's accused of greenwashing, let's say, where they say, you know, we're doing X, Y, Z and they haven't really done all that much of X, Y, Z, but they are talking about it and they're thinking about it. What some people believe is making the statement and having the conversation is actually a powerful first step. And while some companies might do it at first to check the box, oftentimes that step, that box being checked is the thing that then leads to more substantial positive action. So there's one, you know, there's one mindset that says, yes, it's kind of annoying, but it also is the, it's often the, it's kind of the low hanging fruit that sparks the conversations that follow. And then on the flip side, of course, we have companies that are making claims that are just simply not true. And, you know, they may or may not be doing the things that they're doing. And as we've seen a lot of in the last, you know, few months, especially in the U.S., we have seen all sorts of people being called out in, you know, <laughs> various ways for things that they are doing or aren't doing or say they're doing or don't say they're doing. And what I like to believe at the end of the day is that ultimately truth wins and, you know, that idea that the truth has legs. So even if there is this period where maybe there's a gap between what companies say they're doing and what they're actually doing. I like to, I like to trust that the truth always wins and that ultimately, you know, especially as consumers become more and more informed that we can read and learn and make choices. And, you know, to your earlier point about authenticity, that we can choose to engage with the companies that we feel that align with our values. And I feel like at the end of the day, a lot of times, you know, people can kind of see through the illusions and we can kind of feel in our gut and in our bones what, what's authentic. So that's what I like to believe at the end of the day. <laughs> and that, that might be a bit of a utopic uh, vision, but it's the one that I am, that I'm holding on to personally. No, I, I like it. And, and I, I agree with you that, you know, it's the first step that maybe counts in this transition towards, you know, more transparency and, and, and more, yeah, maybe also more accountability. And I'm, I'm actually thinking of a conversation that I had, let me just check when this was, yeah, it was a couple of episodes ago with a company called Impact with mm. two A's and I think it's C. I'll put the link in the in the show notes to that conversation. So a team who's building crowd sourcing basically a a some kind of accountability tool for these topics. So you know for, to hold companies, big companies like Amazon and and Nestle and all these bigger multinationals accountable for their statements, and then it's people inside the companies who are writing reviews and and you know other kind of like just public opinions about this company and their statements and so there are things being put in place i think more and more because we are so much in the age of transparency and no more lies that people won't just believe whatever any company puts out there. And so I think you're totally right that the first step is, you know, important. And I think as time goes on, that the people will really come up also with tools. Like one example is Glassdoor, which is a site where people, employees can review their employer and leave comments on, you know, how it is to work at this and that company. So something like that is, you know, being created as we speak for these greenwashing uh, messages and, and, and ideas. So, so I think you're, you're right. It's, it's all a, it's a, in a way, it's a transition towards more transparency, towards hopefully also more uh, accountability and, and really having companies realize that the conscious client, uh, that's what he wants. That's what she wants. I think you're absolutely right. And one other app that your listeners might really like as well is called Goods Unite Us. 
and it, it was founded here in Madison, Wisconsin, in the U.S. where I live. And it's it's this amazing app, and you can go in and you can look up all sorts of different companies. They're continually adding new companies to their database, and you can see where they donated politically. <laughs> so what's been really interesting with that app is, to your point, and to the, you know, kind of the point of this question is, there are certain companies that you know, they might have a mission that's very like environmentally focused or, you know, all about equity or whatever it might be. And then if you peel back the layers and look at where did this company actually donate, how how much money did they donate to various, you know, political campaigns? And then you can even see certain executives within the company, how, the, how they donated. It's really, really fascinating. And so, you know, you can look at your grocery stores or your cell phone companies or, you know, the online clothing brands that you buy to make sure that your the companies that you're supporting actually align with your political views and, and the causes that you care about. That's so interesting. Yeah, definitely send me the link for that too and we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> You know, we're, we're recording this end of August, and as we discussed offline, the U.S. is kind of still in the middle of COVID over here. It's coming back slowly. So do you think that COVID-19 has impacted and will further impact leadership and the values of organizations? And, you know, will people and companies pay more attention to the triple bottom line? Yeah, it's a great question. And I have found it to be a fascinating exercise in leadership. So it's one of those things where it's easy to lead when times are good. And it's really hard to lead when times are bad. Mm -hmm. And what I have found to be fascinating is the span of what leadership has looked like during this time. (laughs) And we could look at that question on a on a national level in the United States, but drilling down a bit further to a company level, I've been so inspired by several of my clients where, you know, the president or CEO has been up in front of the company virtually, you know, every single day for months on end giving updates. So I have one of my client partners, the president and CEO, who is who is fantastic. He has been doing daily videos. They've been doing you know daily memos. They've been really on top of the communication, and they've been you know he's been leading throughout this entire time to say like this is what's happening. This is where we're going as a company. You know what are the questions that you have? And talking to team members on the ground, they've said I feel so grateful you know, I feel so lucky to work here. I'm so fortunate that I still have this job. I feel really safe. I feel, you know, I feel really good about how we're handling this transition. On the flip side, I've observed other companies where the leaders haven't given any updates and the leaders have sort of been missing. Mm -hmm. Um, In some cases, there have been instances where people haven't felt safe to go to their uh, managers or their leaders to talk about concerns. And so instead, you know, they've felt like their only outlet is to go to the media. And what's been interesting from my observation is how different organizations and different leaders have chosen to lead or communicate during this time. And what I have observed is that the leaders who have stepped up and who have, you know, embraced their values and uh, used this opportunity as a way to really reconnect to who they are in those organizations, people feel safe, you know, people feel secure, even though it's a really, you know, turbulent time. And in the organizations where people maybe don't feel as safe because they don't feel like they have somewhere to go with concerns, it's created a really, really different, really different climate. So, you know, thinking about how this might impact triple bottom line or or coming back to values in the best case scenario, I have observed clients using this time to reconnect to their values to say, you know, at the end of the day, who are we? And how do we want to show up not only now, but also in the future? And Mm -hmm. how do we want to use this time to inform, you know, who we are and who we are becoming so that we can be, you know, the strongest, most resilient version of ourselves? I love it. Yeah, I I think 
what you said is so true values, right? Coming back to their origin story in a way, who are we and what's important to us? And, and the big word also is transparency. It's like, yeah. look, here's what's going on. Here's what we have to decide on a daily basis. These are the big decisions. These are the small decisions, in, inclusion instead of exclusion. So, yeah, so, so true that these are the, these are the brave leaders going forward. And, and the other ones, well, right now, they're still kind of hanging on to their power. But I, I think eventually... Yeah, it it just won't work like this anymore. I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, thinking about the intersection of the three P's, people, profit, and planet, what I've also found interesting is how leaders have navigated really difficult decisions during this time. So, Mm -hmm. for example, you know, a lot of companies have had to reduce their workforce. They have had to move people to furlough. They've had to, you know, make really hard decisions about their people. and if we're looking at that P, the, the, the people P, I've found this to be a fascinating exercise in, are we walking our walk and talking our talk about, about the people pillar? So, you know, I've, I've observed some companies where they have, you know, they've had to terminate people's positions and they have done it with no communication, very little notice in a way that has totally shocked people and really, you know, ruined their experience with the company in many ways because it was handled so, so poorly. On the flip side, I have another client where they had to make a similarly difficult decision and they made a reduction of their team, but they handled it with so much care, with so much thoughtfulness. They, They communicated in a really transparent, you know, open and compassionate way. And they shared the why and they shared, you know, to come back to the, the beginning of the podcast, they shared the purpose behind it. And the whole thing was handled beautifully. And people, of course, were really sad because people love the company and they love working there, but they totally un- understood the why. And again, uh, coming back to how do we lead not only when things are good, but how do we lead when things are hard? Mm-hmm. I, I think this has been, you know, it, it's really, it's really shown us what's possible on both ends in terms of how we can do that really effectively and also you know, how we can, what that can look in a less effective way. Yeah, I think, I think on a national level, uh, we've all had one good example on how not to do it. Oh, so yes. people, people are very clear about, at least our kind of people are very clear how, on how not to, or, or how they no longer um, want to, yeah, be led in a way, right? Because uh, clearly... Absolutely it's the opposite of transparency. It's the opposite of clarity. It's all the other things. So. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to your, to your earlier point about accountability, I think it's a really hard question right now. You know, people, individuals can seek accountability, but I think to tie these two topics together as a country being in the United States right now, it's a really hard question to look at accountability because at a national level, there has been so little accountability for so many things mm-hmm. and at the, you know, at the highest level of our country. So, you know, it's like <laughs> we think accountability matters and it does to, you know, to, to people in your community and my community. And at least in the United States, it's like, well, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it feels like accountability doesn't really matter. And as a nation, we haven't really valued that. So I, I think it's really tricky. It's so true. It feels like, well, how can I expect accountability if I don't, you know, if I get shown such a bad example on on a political national level? Exactly. So true. Yeah. I don't want to end on a bad note. I want to end on a good note. So tell me where you see, you know, things heading in terms of leadership. We kind of said it, but let's just summarize so that we end on a, on a good note, on a positive note. Yeah, that's great. Like I said before, I like to think that the truth will win. And, you know, you and I were talking before we hit record about the fact that we're in this really messy, difficult period as a world. And that hopefully, ultimately, this is leading to something better and something, you know, it it feels like to me, we're in this cracking open place where 
everything right now is cracking open and we're being forced to look at all of the, you know, the underside of everything that we have not looked at maybe ever or for a very long time. And so I like to think that, I like to think that ultimately, you know, the truth will win and that ultimately we'll all be forced to be better because of what we're going through right now. And I think that, you know, that applies for, you know, how we're navigating the world in general. I think that applies to leadership. So, so that's what I like to think. And, you know, tying this back to the, the triple win or the, the triple bottom line, I believe that we're moving more and more in that direction and that, you know, maybe in 10 years or 20 years or however many years that will just become the way of doing business. So that's, that's what I like to hope for, at least in an optimistic view. I'm curious, you know, I, I talk about this a lot from a leadership and business perspective, and you talk about this a lot from a marketing perspective. What do you think? And how do you think that marketing is shifting as, as we look to this new future together? Yeah, very, very similarly. I mean, I, I think the, I totally believe also that the way we do business will change and that requires to change our approach to marketing because yeah. right now we're not uh, using transparency in marketing. We're not really, um, you know, using too much empathy and, and kindness. And so we need to switch and doesn't matter to me which one changes first, right? Whether we change the way we do business and go more towards the triple bottom line or whether we start with marketing and then bring in the, maybe the the planet, you know, the kind of the nonprofit side of, of things doesn't matter to me, but I think they go hand in hand. I totally think they go hand in hand because we see it with, with B corporations. They are doing business for good. That's mm-hmm. kind of their slogan. And, and and it can't be that they do hype marketing, you know, that would just, that would not work. So it, it goes hand in hand. If you want to be a business who does business for good, who pays attention to the tri- triple bottom line, then you also need to be gentle and not aggressive and hypey in your marketing. So <laughs> I love that. And not to, not to take us too far down a rabbit hole as we're working to conclude, but what do you think about that? This is, this is something that's been on my mind mind so often for the last couple of years, this idea of what you called hype marketing. Like, you know, I feel like there's, there's so much emphasis right now on, you know, be an influencer or, you know, you go on LinkedIn and everyone's like trying to be a content creator, whether or not they're creating valuable content. And of course we see it with like, you know, Instagram influencers and just this, this very hypey way of, it's it's almost like to me it's like the opposite of less but better it's like more but worse um, yeah. <laughs> and it feels like it's so common and it's so loud and it's just you know inundating us from everywhere do you feel like that's going to shift do you feel like that's a phase or what do you think about that idea of of hype marketing as it relates to where we might be going you know in the future toward a more like conscious or gentle way of doing marketing and business I think what else, what you also said about the, you know the truth will win eventually that's what will win as well in marketing mm-hmm. so you know if you are an influencer who actually tells the truth then I don't see anything wrong with that if you use your influence because you already built a big company or whatever it is and use your influence now, then, you know, great if you have a great message to share. Mm -hmm. But in the end, the truth will win. And I think what will change is that what I say is that wouldn't it be great if the companies who use gentle marketing and who do business for good are also the companies who have the biggest influence and who make the most money. That's the world I want to see and then do it in a gentle way. So it's no longer about competition and, you know, let's see if I have more influence than you, but they use their influence to help everyone make the world a better place. And it's not no longer coming from ego, but it's coming from love. So I think that's where we're heading. I don't know when that will be, but yeah. sometimes <laughs> these things happen very fast. You know, it just needs some event like maybe COVID and, and maybe, you know, something else where people are like, wow, yeah, I really can't deal with that 
hypey stuff anymore and and things will start to change. I love that. Yeah, I just got chills when you described that vision of, you know, operating from love versus ego and those conscious businesses or that conscious or gentle way of marketing like that at the end of the day is what wins. That feels really inspiring and feels really, really hopeful. <laughs> we could go on and on and on. And on. <laughs> <laughs> totally. This has been terrific. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I couldn't think of a better person than, than you to discuss this. I want to end with uh, a last question. What are you grateful for today or this week, Sarah? Mm, well, I love summer. I'm, it's my favorite season and I love sunshine and warm weather and just the whole season of summer. So I feel really, really grateful for summer and the ability to be outside. And, you know, I feel really grateful that I have my safety and, you know, shelter and a lot of these things that a lot of people don't have right now. So really feeling grateful for these, these simple joys of everyday life, um, especially in the time that we're in right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on to the show. And it's been a great pleasure to talk to you, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. And I am so, so, so excited for you and your new book and cannot wait to read it and can't wait to share it with my community as well. It feels so needed in our world. So I'm really excited for you. Wonderful. And, and please do share your website. I almost forgot because I highly recommend that people sign up to your newsletter. So please tell the audience where they can find that. Oh, yes. Thank you. So my website is zingcollaborative.com, Z-I-N-G. And as you mentioned, on there, you can sign up for what I call Friday Favorites. It's my newsletter. It's totally free. And it's it's just something I put a lot of love into each week in sharing you know, the, the things that I've found useful throughout the week in terms of podcasts or books or articles, tools, technology, things that things that I'm enjoying or appreciating or finding to be relevant. And then I also have a new online community that I've launched. It's called The Garden. And it's an online community. And the spirit is really, it's, it's a place to come back to and a place to get filled up and nourished so that we can then go out into the world and, you know, have the kind of impact that we want to have and do the things that we're doing. So we have a mix of some, you know, live workshops and some connection calls and of course, lots of resources and things like that. So if anyone from your community wants to check that out, we made a, a little code for your community and it's just, the code is gentle. So I'll, I'll share the link with you afterwards, but if anyone wants to try that out, it, it offers them a free month with access to that community. Wonderful. And I love the code. So yeah. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. We'll talk soon. I hope you enjoyed this episode and really found some inspiration. So maybe ask yourself what little changes you can make in your business to bring in that triple bottom line to, you know, really look at these three wins, the planet, your clients, and yourself. And as we shared, it's often with the self that we need to start. To find out more about Sarah and her work, you can go over to zincollaborative.com. And for all the links, as always, check out the show notes at sarahzinacroce.com forward slash GBR59. On there, you'll also find the link to Sarah's online community for exquisite humans. Uh, she calls it the garden. I love that name for a community. Sarah offers you a free month when you use the code GENTLE on the checkout page. So go check that out over at sarasnacroce.com GBR59, where all the links are, or directly on her website, zincollaborative.com. Also, a quick personal reminder to come over to sarasnacroce.com forward slash Kickstarter Come over there and hit notify to be sure to know when our Kickstarter campaign goes live in December. You don't want to miss the early bird offer to join the Gentle Business Circle for a full year and get the book, of course, at a very reduced price. I hope you'll join me on this journey to a kinder marketing paradigm and business paradigm. Please invite your friends if you feel inclined to do so by sharing this podcast or the Gentle Business Manifesto with them. 
both can be found at thegentlebusinessrevolution.com. Let's be the change we want to see in the world. Talk to you soon.